and the various ways to do that. Today we have Ben. Ben with us from Serve Now. Ben grew up in Quarryville. Uh, I know his family well. His family has meant a great deal to me uh, over the years. His mom and dad are here today. I was very excited to see them. It's been a while since, I see, since I've last seen them, and they live right here in Quarryville. And uh, it's interesting, when Ben came in, a little inter in interesting interaction you had with Scott. You know, uh, Lancaster County is one of those places where you're never too far from anyone. And, uh, you know, he came in, he saw Scott, Scott Lingo, our music ministry director, and, and he said, whoa, you know, I didn't expect to see you here. And Scott, you know, Scott was kind of surprised to see him. And it turns out that Scott was your... So I think youth leader, Sunday school teacher, and I know whatever comes out this morning, if you don't agree with it, it's his fault. <laughs> He said, blame Scott. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing how the Lord, uh, we, we've often seen it, the Lord brings people into our lives, yeah. and uh, you just never know how he's going to bring them back around or when he'll bring them back around. So yeah. amazing. Ben has just recently uh, returned from a trip to Nigeria and Ethiopia, and he was in those countries um, at, a, at a really tumultuous time. I mean, not only is COVID going on, but then the, the war in Ukraine began uh, yeah. while you were there. But you were in, I believe, was it Ethiopia or Nigeria that you were starting, uh, beginning for the first time, kind of breaking open Ethiopia. Serve Now in Ethiopia. Ethiopia. So for the first time in Ethiopia, uh, Serve Now is kind of beginning to uh, unfurl and unwrap the gospel uh, to the people there uh, through their organization. And so we're looking forward to hearing more about how God's working in your life and what he's doing. Can I pray with you before yeah. you start? Come yeah. on in. Lord, thank you for Ben. Thank you for his life and his ministry. Uh, thank you, Lord, that many years ago you've placed this calling uh, on his life. That you, you brought him uh, from a little town in Quarryville, Pennsylvania, to an international uh, organization where he's able to serve you all over the world. And we just give you the glory for that. We thank you for the years of experience that you gave him serving as a pastor and a ministry leader in New Jersey. We thank you for the connections that he made through his time at Lancaster Bible College as he was uh, studying there and uh, for the friendships that he made. And we just thank you for the way that you've formed his heart and uh, have allowed him to uh, use his gift of writing and speaking to bless ministries, churches, and ministry leaders all over the world. And so we look forward to hearing him today and how you'll speak through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Good morning to everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you. Uh, you know, Chris had said when we came in, he, he made a comment about uh, hearing, he hears a lot of bad things about the church or people making comments about the church, and he said he sometimes wants to talk about our family and point out some good things in the church. And I said, well, Chris, that may be true for my parents, might be true for my two younger brothers, but you send people in, to me, and they spend even a day or two, and they'll see some things wrong <laughs> with the church, too, just by looking at my life. And I think Kendall and Simeon could probably testify to that, too, because uh, Simeon and I have spent more time together traveling around the world, or at least I have with him, than anybody else over these last couple years, as Serve Now continues to grow uh, the quickest and in the most countries now in Africa, even over these last two years. So anyway, uh, there might be some good there, but I know there's also some things that are not so good there too, as is true, I think, in all of our lives. Well, anyway, yeah, when I came in, I was surprised to see Scott Lingo, and, uh, and, and Chris, of course, already mentioned that, but I was thinking about, as we were worshiping and, and Scott was up here singing, that years ago, when I was a teenager and really struggling with Jesus and truly following him and being an athlete and just not sure how this all works in my life and was very shy, very insecure. You, I, if you would have told me then, years ago, that I would be standing up here talking to you now, uh, would have had no idea who you're talking to or talking about. But I remembered this letter that Scott wrote me back when I was a teenager, and even then, he wrote some things pointing to him seeing some leadership possibilities or capabilities there and 
basically prophesying that one day he could see me uh, leading people and bringing people to Christ. And I remember when he first wrote that letter, I thought he must have handed that to the wrong person. And I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, but I, I remember we got together a couple year, actually a couple years ago and sat down for the first time since then. And looking back at that letter, it was quite remarkable what Scott saw, what he prayed, what the Lord had put on his heart, and just how God works that way. So I really appreciate Scott's leadership and ministry in my life. I, I remember that time growing up, many of the things that he caught, even though I may not have wanted to let on, were at work in my heart and were seeds that were planted by, by him. And so even when you may not know if God is working or wonder if he's using your life, just know that you never know what he's doing, what he's up to, and what he might do in the future. So thank you, Scott, for your impact and influence on my life. Well, I didn't plan to share any of that uh, this morning, <laughs> but it's always fun when God surprises us in those ways. Um, it's good to be here with you. I was here a couple years ago with our director in India, Super Tim, uh, I think now two or three years ago, and this year very excited to, to be present with you, uh, or to have present with us this year, Simeon from Burundi. And so Tuesday night, he's going to be sharing a little bit more here, uh, specifically about what God is doing through Serve Now in Africa. And then tonight, Kendall Keeler, who is our East Coast representative for Serve Now, he's going to be sharing to the men on our theme for this year, Serve Like Jesus. And we actually have a devotion along that same lines, a 30-day devotion in engaging to serve like Jesus would serve right here and all over the world. So those resources are also available. But I know this week you're going to be hearing <clears throat> from a lot of different missionaries. You're going to hear from a lot of different mission organizations. Chris went through the list just represented for this week. So I see it as my job. Now, Chris, you told me how to do this. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I see it as my job this morning to connect what you're going to hear this week with what God's word has to say related to missions, and more specifically, his heart for the people of the world, sorry, I moved that ahead too soon, <laughs> his heart for the people of the world, not just what Serve Now is seeking to do to serve like Jesus worldwide. So now you'll know what the next slide is, but you've probably heard the saying, start with the end in mind. Has anybody heard this before? Start with the end in mind. Whether in the business world or setting of personal goals, you'll often hear this kind of advice to gain clarity on what it is that you hope to accomplish and what you want the end result to look like. So some people have gone as far as, in fact, there was an author who made this popular, to encourage people to write their own obituary, which sounds a little morbid, but the idea is, what do you want people to say about you after you die? What do you want them to remember you for. And the reason that this is encouraged by some is that the idea is by, by, by envisioning the future or living with the end in mind, if you have clarity about that, you find inspiration and motivation to work towards that future and that goal today. So what is it that by the end of your life you would like to see accomplished, you feel the Lord's calling you to do? If you have clarity about the end, it helps you to know what to do today. Well, here's where I want to go with this idea. As Christians, we know what the end looks like. Amen? And it's plastered all over as the theme of your conference from Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Now, I put in here also Revelation 7-9. This is when John the Apostle 
has this vision of the future. He says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So that is not only God's goal, but it is what the end or what heaven will look like, according to the word of God. And this also tells us something profound about not only missions, but God's heart for the world. And of course, I know probably everyone in this room is quite familiar with John 3.16, for God so loved who? Not just Americans, not just Ukrainians, not just Russians, not just you put, plug in the name, but God so loved the whole world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God's heart is for all the world, for all people, all tribes, all cultures, all languages. And my encouragement this week as we go through this mission week together, and I know this church has done this for a long time. In fact, I, I was commenting to some people, I think you're one of the few churches that still does this all week long. It's, it's become rarer and rarer for a church to have a missions conference all week long. Uh, so it's a very special thing that's still happening here. My encouragement is this. Let's not just hear with our heads what is going to be told or spoken this week, but let's hear with our hearts. Let's not just hear with our heads, let's hear with our hearts. And even more than that, let's ask God to give us his heart for all the world and all the people in this world. The reason I wanted to highlight this is because we live in a, an extremely polarized world in every way, politically, culturally, and globally. Right here in the United States, especially when it comes to politics, very divided. And then when it comes to the world, you can just look at what's happening right now in a way that's become very personal to so many of us. We are experiencing the worst war and refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. For us at Serve Now, this has hit home in a very personal way, as it has for, again, many of you. Uh, our work in Ukraine actually began in 2014 because Russia invaded and annexed Crimea. That's where almost all of our leaders, all of our staff, volunteers, people we've been serving over these last eight years, almost all are refugees from Crimea or internally displaced people from East Ukraine. So before this current war, war broke out, a lot of people may not have realized this, but uh, there were already over 15,000 people killed in this ongoing conflict, Crimea, East Ukraine. And 1.6 million refugees from that alone over the last eight years. Now, what has just completely overwhelmed us has been the fact that within two weeks in this current war, that number has already been surpassed. Just a staggering, heartbreaking, gut-wrenching gut reality. But before all this, I've been in the war zone, and again, all of our people, work, majority, have been affected by this, again, before this larger war broke out. And when this happened, even months prior to it, we had planned and coordinated with Ukrainian military chaplains that we have had relationship with over these years. We had already planned evacuation routes, and safe housing locations, so we're now taking care of all of our staff, our leaders, our teams, our main church partners, our volunteers, and, uh, and over the last couple of weeks, we've been focused on continuing to evacuate as many people, vulnerable people, as we can. That number now up over 260-some people that we are 
uh, not only have helped evacuate, but providing for daily with lodging and food and just basic needs, many of them women and children. We have a number of either pregnant women or women who had just given birth or those with small children. And if I, I could just stand up here and tell story after story after story, that is just absolutely gut-wrenching of what people are facing and going through. But I know people, uh, civilians who have been killed in this. I've been to many of the places that you're seeing on the news being destroyed. I receive daily videos and pictures that can only be labeled as war crimes. And I can tell you, and I'm sure many here can even identify with this, I have personally thought things I never thought I would think. I've prayed prayers that I thought I never would pray. You can read Psalm 58 or Psalm 35 if you want to see some of the ways I've learned to pray in a new way recently. I felt, and still do, a depth of emotion that I never thought would be possible. This has been by far the worst thing, the worst crisis that for Serve Now we've ever gone through. And every year, we're now in 20 different countries of the world, so every year there's always a disaster, there's always a crisis, there's always something that happens. But this is just how unnecessary it is, the fact that it's man-made, the fact that uh, we don't know how long this is going to go on, the stories, the videos, the, all of it is just beyond words. And the reason I'm sharing this is because on a very deep personal level, I've wrestled with overwhelming, I've never experienced this level of anger, this level of rage. I've realized how easy it would be for me to do things that I thought I maybe could never have done if I was in the right place at the right time or if I was there in Ukraine right now. And I've also realized how easy it is to be overcome with hatred towards even a certain country and people right now. And I'm not saying that because I'm proud of it. I'm not saying that, that because it's right. I'm just saying that even what I'm about to share with you in a moment, I'm, sp I'm going to be speaking to myself more than anybody else here this morning. But I can understand and relate to why even Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh when God called him to go there. And even when Jonah did go there, he didn't do it with God's heart towards the people of Nineveh because he knew God's heart towards the people of Nineveh and he didn't like it. I don't know what your pain points might be this morning, but many of us at times in different seasons for different reasons can carry a prejudice towards other people, cultures, and countries. Again, for any number of reasons. And to be sure, I do think there is a place, I think you see it in Scripture and some of the Psalms that I referenced earlier, I think there is a place for praying certain kinds of prayers that are focused on asking for God to put an end to evil that's being perpetrated upon innocent and vulnerable people. I, I believe that there's a place for that. If you come to the Tuesday night's meeting, uh, you're again going to hear from Simeon, our main Africa director for Serve Now, and he'll share a little bit about his experience living through what we know as the Rwanda genocide, but there was also a reality in his country of Burundi that a lot of people don't realize that actually was spread over 11, 12-year period. So it was less, you know, Rwanda was, I think, what, a couple months and a million people killed. Uh, Burundi was facing the exact same challenges, just spread out over a longer period with less people killed, but still over 300,000 people killed in that very same Hutu, Tutsi conflict that we know of as the Rwanda genocide. So he's going to share a little bit more about that because he lived right in the middle of that and led some very powerful reconciliation efforts during that time in his country and is still known and respected in Africa for his efforts 
during that time in that whole crisis and situation. My point is this. Evil has and it does exist in the world. And we can, and I think it's right, to pray that God would put an end to wickedness and evil and injustice. But at the same time, and again, I'm learning this all fresh again, very personally, we also have to guard our own hearts from prejudice towards different people, cultures, or country. Because here's the pure truth from God's word. Around the throne in heaven, there will be Ukrainians and there will be Russian people. There will be those from the Hutu tribe and those from the Tutsi tribe. There will be those who speak English and there will be those who don't speak English. Heaven, I believe, will not erase our differences or our distinctions, but rather heaven or Jesus himself will unite us despite our distinctions and our differences. And our very differences and distinctions, I believe, will, and they do, magnify and glorify the beauty of God. They reveal who God is, our very differences and distinctions. Culturally, language, our style of worship, those kinds of things. I mentioned earlier, Serve Now is now in 20 countries around the world working in 45 different languages and growing. And in traveling the world, one of my absolute favorite things to witness, to participate in, to, to see, is the worship of believers in different cultures and in different languages. I love hearing people worship in a language that I don't even understand, but knowing who they're worshiping. And knowing that as they worship, we're worshiping the same Lord, the same God, the same Spirit. And I can tell you that when we give people God's Word in their language, we have a series of discipleship booklets called The Basic Things You Need to Know. It's a series of 30 books, uh, just 32 pages each, now in 45 languages and growing around the world. But when we give those discipleship booklets to people in their language, in their countries, it makes all the difference in the world to them. Simeon and I were recently, a couple months ago, in Burundi, in, uh, not Burundi, in Benin, which is a little country in West Africa. And when we, when we started there in a particular, uh, uh, some remote villages, we were only focused on using our French translation. Because we start with languages that are spoken by most people, or by the most people. Here, here's a picture of us, actually, or of me, uh, looking very African there. Which is the only time you're going to see me looking like that, is if you come with me to Africa. So if you want to see that, you've got to come with me to Africa. <laughs> uh, but when we started there, we were only focused on French, but there was a Yoruba-speaking area that was asking for books in their native language even though they had some there that knew were reading and were using our French books. Well, we decided that, yes, we would launch that translation for that group of people living in that part of the country. And of all the groups we met with that week, you want to guess which group was by far the most excited, the most joyful, the most touched, the most inspired? It was this group right here. Because God's word was coming to them in their language. It makes a difference. And it's a beautiful thing to behold. So that's why we actually now are dreaming some pretty crazy prayers. We're, Serve Now is only in our ninth year, uh, but I was just actually doing the numbers um, this morning for the end of our fiscal year. Our fiscal year runs April through March. So we're coming right up on the end of one year, heading into a new year. So I've been getting all the numbers from around the world and getting ready to put different reports together for a board meeting we have come up and then other things. And uh, this last fiscal year, we were able to serve over 700,000 people in these 20 different countries. 
And so as we continue to grow, we have some of these wild dreams and goals, some of them up here on the, st- on the screen, that with this basic series discipleship program that we have, which is really core and foundational to everything in every country, by 2030, we're looking at perhaps translating these in the top 100 languages of the world that are spoken by 85% of the world population. You know, there's somewhere between 6,500, 7,000 languages, dialects, but just a hundred of those are spoken by 85% of the world's population. And then by 2050, we're looking at having these in the top 300 languages spoken by 95% of the world. And then my joke has been by then I'll either be uh, looking at retiring or I'll be dead or martyred somewhere or something. So my kids, our kids and grandkids can worry about the other 6,500. We'll, we'll leave the hard part to them. <laughs> But see, in heaven, I believe, we will not all speak the same earthly language. I don't think we'll even all be worshiping the exact same way. Rather, I think it'll be a beautiful tapestry of many different people, languages, worship styles, all focused and united, not on those differences, but worshiping the lamb who was slain for all of our sins. And a Savior who loves us like no other. And if that's going to be true of heaven, then the church is called to be a reflection of that on earth. And that means that prejudice has no place in our hearts and lives. So that means I must have God's heart for all people, Ukrainian and Russian, or put in whatever group of people you want to put in there. By the way, I grapple with a lot of this in, in my newest book. This, this was written before this current conflict, so the book that I'm writing now is going to include some things from what's happening in Ukraine. But uh, last year I wrote this book, Everything is Meaningless, Finding Purpose in a World of Despair. And in chapter 4, uh, the title of that chapter is I, I titled Injustice Rolls On. So this whole book is taken from the book of Ecclesiastes. So every chapter is based on some verse or theme in the book of Ecclesiastes. But in this chapter, I grapple with a statement that Solomon makes about the reality of oppression around the world and injustice just going on and power being on, on the side of the wicked and, and, uh, and the evil of that. And I talk about just not only the reality of evil, but uh, how many of us, sometimes more than we might like to admit or, or think about, wrestle with prejudice towards some person or some group of people or uh, some culture, some language, whatever it may be. Again, different, different reasons. And by the way, <laughs> just so I'm clear, I'm not talking about critical race theory. Uh, that's, that's a whole other thing. And in fact, I have a part in the book saying that's not what I'm talking about or what I'm, where I'm going with all of this. Uh, but In this chapter, I talk about ServNow's efforts, for example, at the U.S.-Mexico border and the controversy that that caused us as an organization when we started that work to serve legal immigrants at the border. There were a number of people, even church people, who had a problem with that and didn't like that because of a certain idea and stereotype that many have towards others from another culture. So I talk about the reality of racism, the reality of prejudice, the reality of injustice happening around the world. But in that chapter, I conclude with a reminder of a verse that I think here in the Western world, we perhaps have not communicated, seen as clearly as I think we need to. From Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. I think this is a truth that we struggle with, or again, have emphasized one part of this, but not the other part of this. So let's let's look at it and read it here together. The Apostle Paul is writing this, and he is writing about Jews and Gentiles, who at that time, two very different groups of people, two very different cultures. But this is what he says about how God reconciles us not just to himself through the cross, but through the cross reconciles us to one another, 
despite our differences. Here's what it says. For he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups, again, in this context, he's writing about Jews and Gentiles, but I think you could put in any two groups of people here. You pick. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, that's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, in, in, in my book, though, I break it down or put it this way because I think this is the easiest way to visualize what Paul is saying here. He's saying the cross extends not just vertically between God and man. The cross not only reconciles us with God, but it reconciles us with one another. Jesus' arms were stretched vertically as well as his body horizontally. I said that backwards, didn't I? This is vertical. This is It's Scott's fault. He taught me everything I know. <laughs> I think you get my point though, right? <laughs> okay. The cross reconciles us not with not just with God but also with one another. And I think that's the part we've neglected. Even in our salvation messages we talk about and of course it's the primary necessary need of all humanity is to be reconciled with God, but in God reconciling us to himself through Christ on the cross, he has also reconciled us to one another as brothers and sisters now in Christ no matter our differences and distinctions. Amen? And that bond as brothers and sisters in Christ is stronger than any other bond. And it's stronger than any other difference. But we have to work at doing all we can to keep that bond of peace that we have in Christ. Despite any other differences. So, you know... I don't have to become African when I am uh, in Africa. Of course, you saw a picture of me looking African. <laughs> but I'm still a white boy from rural Pennsylvania, Lancaster County. So I, I can certainly appreciate and respect, and we'll talk about that in a moment as I conclude, other cultures and, and differences. But I can tell you, I still can't dance like an African can dance, <laughs> even if I might dress like an African would dress when in Africa. But neither do Africans need to become Americans. And even Americans share many differences culturally depending on where you're born and where you were raised and all those things. Even from right here to just whatever it is, 20 minutes to Lancaster City. I've worked in both contexts here and right in the city. And there's a gigantic difference just 20 minutes apart culturally. Not being prejudiced doesn't mean that we lose all of our cultural distinctions, but not being prejudiced does mean that I can see and appreciate and respect others from different cultures despite whatever differences may exist. And farther, every human being, I think this is ultimately what it comes back down to, every human being has been created by God in the image of God, from every culture, every tribe, every language. Genesis 127, right in the beginning of the Bible. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. There's differences. There's distinction. But he created them both. Amen? Psalm 139 13 through 16, you created my inmost being. It's not just that God has made 
male and female in his image. It's that he's made every individual in his image. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, what a powerful scripture. Your eyes saw my unformed body. God envisioned you before you even were. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to pass. God knew you before you even existed. That's an incredible, staggering thought. He uniquely created you. He uniquely created me. He uniquely created every human being. And I think this is a truth that as a church we need to rediscover again at a deep heart level because I, I really believe what's happening, what's wrong with the world today and what the church can and should and is called to be is to model something differently. We're to be a little microcosm of heaven on earth, a picture of what heaven will be like, where despite our differences, we can worship together uniquely in a way that reflects the beauty and the glory of God. So my questions as we close uh, that apparently are not on my PowerPoint are, <laughs> are what if we really looked at one another and other countries, other people, other languages, other cultures through the eyes and the heart of God? I isn't it so easy to look at the world through just a political lens or just a cultural lens or just this lens or that lens. But what if we looked at one another and the world, every person, every tribe, every language, every culture through the eyes and the heart of God? What if we looked for the image of God in others? Every person that you come across that you interact with this week, what if we looked for the unique imprint an image of God on that person? What is it about that person that reflects something of the nature and the character of God? None of us do that perfectly, right? We all have sinned and fall short of the glory, the image of God. But at the same time, all of us, as believers, every human being, there's something of the image of God that we can look for in each person that we interact with that reflects something of his nature and character? Where can we see the image of God and the beauty of God? Even as for those who go or in a position to give this week or as we pray for the nations of the world, we go, we give, we pray not from a position of pride that we're somehow better, but from a position of humility with God's heart for the world, knowing what the future holds, knowing the end that is in store according to his word, that around the throne we're going to be worshiping with people from every tribe, every tongue, every language. And so the point I think I'm trying to make this morning is that we need not only God's word to guide us, we need God's heart to be at work in us and through us for the people of the world. And that's how I want to encourage you to approach this week and everything that you hear from those that are represented this week or going to be representing their ministries this week. Hear not only with your head, but hear with your heart. Listen for God's heart for the countries, the people that are going to be talked about or spoken of at this conference. Listen with the end in mind and then figure out what your part in this partnership with God is. He's inviting all of us, every single one of us, into what he's doing, inviting us to have his heart for the world. And yes, for each one of us, that's going to look different, but for all of us, it's equally important, whatever he calls us to, for the kingdom of God and for the end that we already know is going to be a reality. Amen? Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time together with CNBC.
Thank you for their long history and faithfulness in missions. Thank you for their heart for the world. Thank you for all the missionaries, the mission organizations that they support, the people that they are reaching through their going, through their giving, through their praying. Lord, I pray for your blessing on this week that, again, as every person that is here representing some part of the world or many parts of the world or really all the world, that you would give us your heart for all people. And that in giving us your heart for the world, we would give, we would go, we would pray, we would serve. Father, help us to do that and thank you that we already know what the end has in store. Now it's just up to us in partnership with you as you call us, as you draw us to respond, to step into what you are uniquely putting on each of our hearts for your kingdom and for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, bless this week. Bless everybody that attends every session. Do a work deep in our hearts for all people and for all the world. And we ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.